Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we're in day four of the fifth annual Global Education Conference. We've been having a blast. Emily Liebtag and Julie Keener here. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Really good, yes, really delighted to have you both here. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters, Iron USA, Global Campaign for Education, and what's that third logo there? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, really we are thrilled to have to you guys on board. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are thrilled and to be here. Yeah. These other fine organizations who are supporting this event and allow it to be a free event. Those of you who are participating live, you should now see some icons to the left of the map. You're looking for the second icon down in that toolkit, it's the star. You click on it twice, then click on the map. We're a little North Carolina-centric tonight, seeing as Emily and Julie and I are all close by. But there's Australia. Do put a note in the chat and let us know where you are. Yeah, I think Onaldo's in Mexico, right? And I think, um, who was in Austin? Antoinette in Austin, Texas. Oh, there we go. Welcome to you. And, and to those who were listening to the audio recording, we do appreciate your doing so and hope that you find it worthwhile. So I'm going to do you know? a very quick intro. And I think if it's OK with you, I'm going to move to the slide with your two pictures just for this intro. And you can move back if you'd like. Emily Liebtag is Manager of Curriculum and Instructional Design at VIF International Education. She works on the Curriculum and Instructional Design team and helps create educational resources and professional development focused on global education. Emily taught in Durham Public Schools in North Carolina and has studied elementary education for the past 10 years. In addition to her work at VIF, she's also a doctoral candidate in Curriculum Teaching and Learning at the University of Virginia. Dr. Julie Keene is a senior researcher at VIF International Education. She leads professional development curriculum design and research and evaluation of all VIF programs. Dr. Keene has 20 years of qualitative research and development experience, including six years as researcher for UNC Chapel Hill's National Research Center for Rural Education Support, and 11 years as associate direct project director at the Center for Children and Technology, EDC, Inc. Thanks to both of you for being here. I'm going to deposit you on the right slide and turn it over to you. Hi. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And um, I wanted to, you've probably noticed we, we kind of didn't mean to pull a switcheroo on you. But um, unfortunately, Superintendent John Farrelly couldn't join us for family reasons. So um, Emily was wonderful enough to join me tonight. We've been working very closely with um, the partnership for 21st Century Learning. This is a group that's been around for over 10 years, a membership organization that works in the United States but is now also global, that has been working around 21st century skills and has been working very closely with us and collaborating on developing their global education framework and their state action on global education framework. So for those of you not in the US, we're doing a lot of work um, around state policy to really push this idea that particularly U.S. citizens and also international citizens and uh, students and teachers need to work on global competence and that that's part of now the 21st century skills that are needed, not just around education technology. So we've been partnering with them um, to help them sort of further that work. So Emily, if you want to tell a little bit about us. Sure. So um, given that partnership with the Partnership for 21st Century Skills that Julie just described, VIF International Education, um, the organization that both Julie and I are a part of, uh, has served as not only a partner but a resource as well um, for teachers who are trying to do this type of work, not only to advance their 21st century teaching skills for themselves as well as their students, but also in becoming more global educators. Um, and one of the reasons for that partnership is because that's exactly what we provide. In addition to providing um, dual language programs and cultural exchange teachers um, to schools in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, we also have this really robust system called Global Gateway, where teachers can get just what I described, um, tools, resources, 
um, professional development, a global PLC of teachers, and they can get all of these things online, this global gateway system online, in what we call the BIS Learning Center. So this partnership with P21 made a lot of sense because we um, have a lot of these tools and resources ready to go for teachers to use. So given that um, P21, as you can see on the slide, um, Oops, sorry, 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 that's 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 Sorry, sorry. As you can see on this slide here, um, when P21 moved and started to think more about this global piece, it, it's been a perfect um, marriage of our goals and our vision for educators across the nation um, and how they can start to think about incorporating this global piece into their classrooms and instruction. And so just to hold on, hold on, Emily said a lot of, uh, there are a lot of language learners and working through the closing pages of the ID as I also saw the class maps and a lot of other interests. Um, so I turned Julie's mic off. Emily, was it sounding really bad to you? Yeah, it was as well. Um, that we all can go through this, and then she'll probably join oh, us again. Oh. Okay, how, how is that? How is that? Is it okay? Okay. Can you hear me? Julie, way? for some reason, your audio is really hard to hear and understand. I think I'm going to recommend you log out and log back in again. Okay. But, um, okay. We'll see if that makes it better. Okay, and okay. I can talk us through these. Um, talk us through this. So, so with this partnership, um, P21 outlined the six different goals that you see here on the screen: um, global competency standards for students and teachers, effective and scalable teacher supports, resources, and tools, a new approach to language instruction, moving away from tra traditional language classrooms and making it move more towards um, experiential learning and competency-based learning. Whole school models where they are more internationally themed and focused that are really centered around this idea of global education, networking and bringing in other districts to be a part of this effort, as well as giving global experiences for students and educators. So at BIF, we are certainly doing um, all of these, these six. Today, what we wanted to do is very practically just focus on these first two, um, which are two that I feel we do really, really well um, in our partnership with P21. And so those two we're going to focus on today are looking at global competency standards as well as looking at some real practical, um, scalable supports and resources for teachers. I'm a former teacher, and I know that this is so important to move away from just documents and standards that don't really mean anything for me um, and move towards implementation and what does it look like and what can I actually do with these, this 20-page document um, and make it live and breathe in my classroom. So we're just going to focus right here um, on those two today. And before we look at those tools and supports and the global competency frameworks, I really want to harp on this, that it is a tool. Um, what we're talking about is a tool, and it is not an evaluation tool. Um, these are documents that are designed for teachers and to help support teachers and students in their work and not meant to be another evaluative tool, um, something that your principal or administrator is going to hold you to. Um, it's more about a tool in your professional growth and becoming a more effective global educator. Um, and I think that's really important when we talk about these things because um, all too often you're, you're just faced with something else that you're being assessed on, and that's not the point of this. We want this to be a document that you can use. Um, and um, can I check you. back in with my mic? Is that better? Yep, you okay. sound great now, Julie. So um, all right. just, we talked a little bit about the state action, Julie. I didn't know if you wanted to um, clarify some of those points that you were uh, speaking about before. Um, well, just, uh, and again, forgive me, everyone, if um, Emily covered this, so Emily, just interrupt if I'm covering stuff you already just said. But um, when I started at VIF several years ago, one of the things, um, again, based on my point before about getting it out of the land of jargon and policy and into the classroom was really our goal. Um, we have a long history of working very closely with um, K-12 educators, um, kids from 5 to 18 here in the United States. 
And really, we we basically, I took up shop in a couple of elementary schools, and Emily's been joining me with that work both at the middle and the high school, of what does this really look like for elementary school students? What does this really look like for middle school students? And what does this really look like for high school students? And then what are the skills, attitude skills and knowledge we really need for teachers um, to be able to really support students in that work? Um, and so that's how this really began, was really much more on the student and teacher level um, as opposed to top down. We sort of went from the bottom up a little bit with an eye towards the research literature and also standards and working collaboratively with universities, but spending a lot more time actually in schools. Um, and the other, the other resource that we have, which is extremely unique, is that we have international teachers, um, over five, 600 that are currently in the U.S. and uh, 50, almost 50,000 or um, alumni over the 25 years that we've been working, um, that we've been operating. And so we build on their bicultural expertise also in building these indicators. So Emily, do you want to go and we can talk about the yeah. structure of them a little bit? Great. So we have um, two documents that we've partnered with P21 on. Um, again, one for looking at student indicators and student outcomes of global learning, as well as one um, for teachers, what a global ready teacher um, looks like. What are they thinking? What do they value? What are skills that they possess? Um, and in that teacher document, as you can see in the um, watermark circle here, we broke them up into standards across pedagogy, content and technology. And then from that, we thought, well, what are the things that teachers really need to know in those three different domains? Well, not only do they have to have expertise um, in those areas, but they also have to have leadership skills. And they need to start spreading the word about the things that they're doing and leading teachers not only in their own school and in that, in that work, but also teachers abroad and at large. And that's what we think it really takes and means to be a truly effective global educator. Um, so that's how we broke up the teacher indicators. And we're going to um, take a look on the next slide, more specifically at what that looks like. So here you can see the standards. Um, we have an expertise standard for each of the areas, pedagogy, content, and technology, as well as a leadership standard. So similarly to standards documents, your Common Core State Standards or your North Carolina Essential Standards, we map those out, but for teachers in terms of global readiness. And then from those, we broke out different indicators, attitudes, skills, and knowledge that apply to that specific standard. Um, and this is a, a really good way for teachers to concretely think about what they can do to progress and move forward in their thinking and their behaviors in their classroom. Um, like we said all too often, they, teachers need something really concretely written out. What does this look like? Tell me what you think it looks like. And so that's what we tried to do. Here is an example of um, a standard. You can see standard 1.1. And then the specific attitudes that we feel demonstrate a really um, effective global educator. So the entire document, which we'll discuss with you later how to access it, is broken up just like this according to those three different domains. And now Julie's going to talk with you um, quickly about the layout and the kind of an overview of the student indicators. Yeah, and one, um, thanks Emily. And um, I also, I just wanted to say I totally agree um, with some of the comments um, in the chat, which is that um, we, again, building on what Emily said, really not about evaluation. It's just a guidepost um, for both for teachers and for students themselves as well. Um, the other thing I would just add for the teacher piece is that we built a lot on the theoretical framework of TPAC, which is around t uh, technology, pedagogy, and content. Um, because, um, and then adding the global piece in, but that these are these three domains um, that we think would be really helpful for teachers to use as guideposts for how to build their practice. So in that um, the student indicators um, are built around, I don't know if this is clear visually, but there are um, four learning spirals um, that we built almost our entire program around. Um, both the PD and the curriculum is around understanding, investigating, integrating, and connecting. And so the, spot, the grade level are paired up in K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And then we have secondary indicators. And it basically takes you through what is global competence? What is the understanding, that cultural understanding that, that kids need? What are the research skills 
Research skills is a very big area um, because a lot of global investigations are all about research. So it's, it's pretty heavily um, focused on that. And then what's the integrating? What are the sort of higher level skills that kids need to do to bring all of this stuff together? What's the sort of synthesis that we're looking for kids to do? And then what's the connecting? And a lot of the connecting is not only um, connecting cross-disciplinary projects, but also connecting, obviously, across borders, both within and um, outside of the classroom. So that is how those are, um, and by the way, I did put a links in the chat of where you can access this, but we'll also go through that at the end of the session, because um, these are available on the P21 um, website. Great. Thank the you. other thing, I, oh, I'm so sorry, Emily. One of the other things with the student educators is that they're a formative checklist. So teachers and students can use these checklists as they both start and are engaged in global investigations to sort of, again, use as guideposts. So now what we want to do is just take three really quick examples of different activities and things that we've seen going on in um, global classrooms, as well as break down an example of a resource that we have at BIF to offer teachers to use and do this type of global work, and then kind of overlay and map on how these really simple activities address both some of the global competent student indicators as well as some of those teacher indicators. Again, you know, shifting that mindset to this is just a static document to what does this actually look like and hey, it can be pretty practical and I can readily use this in my classroom tomorrow. Um, so the first example we want to give is Skype as a global tool. Um, I have seen a lot of teachers establish, establish really meaningful classroom partnerships um, from North Carolina with countries around the world or with other countries on the West Coast. And they're doing this through using um, online tools like Skype or Google Hangouts. And this is a really great way to get students to address this indicator where students can start to collaborate and work with other students and they can start to see their world grow and their perspectives um, that they gain from this experience. They're just so great. And we all know that this is the type of work that they're going to be doing when they're in the workforce anyways. It's what we're all doing right now. Um, so starting to expose them to these types of things um, is really great. And as you can see on the screen here, there's a picture of a school in North Carolina where students are Skyping. Um, we actually uh, saw this, maybe it was about a month ago, students were doing a Skype activity. And then you'll see the indicator that addresses there on the right, that's straight from the document. Skype as a global tool also addresses um, teacher indicators because while the students are doing some of that global work, the teachers also are engaging in a global way. Um, I picked the indicator from the teacher document that was specific to technology. As you can see here, we really are thinking that teachers who are becoming more global need to engage in the technology um, and experiment with different technologies and not be afraid to take that risk. Um, getting onto Blackboard and trying it out for the first, uh, Blackboard Illuminate and trying it out for the first time. These types of things we think are indicative of people who are progressing in that, that global competence. So that was our first example. Now Julie's going to share with you one other example. Julie, is your mic off? Yeah, we oh, see no, that yeah, again. Oh, okay. So um, this is a, a project that um, Emily has observed, which um, a teacher using a National Geographic photo of the day to get things started. And this is close to my heart because this was research I've done for a long time around the image, and particularly when you're doing cross-cultural investigations. Um, helping kids question their own cultural assumptions when they're looking at an image um, is really important because a lot of global investigations are sort of driven by Google searches. Um, and so helping kids develop those critical skills to actually look at photos and really how do you actually understand um, a culture through this and what other kinds of research do you actually need to do in order to develop an understanding. Um, and so um, this connects obviously with and in this project, essentially, kids wrote about the photos every single day, and th these were posted. Um, and so the this actually um, tied into a lot of literacy skills around point of view. So we have teachers really sort of talk with kids about, well, who took the picture? 
and where were they and what was the purpose of the original picture if they can figure it out and then looking at how through the internet and through social media pictures are taken and put into new contexts and how the cultural position can change so these are skills that um, students are building from a very young age which they really are going to need to do to be able to traverse a very complicated media environment globally um, and then obviously the finding resources from multiple books, these are all over um, certainly U.S. standards and also international standards in terms of how te um, kids are doing research around mixed media. So that was a, a pretty easy way for teachers to align their global investigations to standards and then these are the indicators. Um, and then for, um, for the teacher competencies, this is um, really, uh, again, close to our heart is that everything throughout these toolkits are really based on inquiry. And for teachers often, unfortunately, in their PD, don't get a lot of inquiry. They're sort of lectured about, to about inquiry. <laughs> so we're asking teachers to engage students in inquiry projects and we're engaging them in PD that's anything but that. So we are really trying to, how do we get um, teachers to get excited and engaged as learners as, as, and having inquiry experiences on their own. Um, and so they, we can really start to see them doing that um, in these global investigations where they're really alongside their kids um, as learners and going through the inquiry process. And then again, integrating culturally relevant content and current world events into instruction. And for me, this is the real power of global education is really about relevance. And it's something we've all known for a long time for problem-based learning and project-based learning. It's really developing that real world and relevant context around investigations and around the standard course of study and regular curriculum. So Emily, did you want to talk about the last bit of our, our curriculum here? Yeah, so um, this, this example is near and dear to my heart as I work on the curriculum instructional design team at VIF and one of my primary roles is working with teachers to create global lessons. Um, and that means anything as small as pulling up a map and looking at different locations around the world to um, engaging in a full-fledged inquiry project with teachers in a classroom in Mexico and building a travel brochure about how classrooms are going to um, visit and meet each other. So. Um, just really thinking about, again, little ways and then more grandiose ways that we can make our lessons more global. And uh, Julie and I have been traveling across the state to view teachers actually implementing and doing this type of work, um, not only using our lesson plans, like you see here on the screen, but also lesson plans that they come up with and are starting to use in their classrooms. Um, so this has been really exciting to see this work moving forward and to see teachers um, using our indicators and then mapping them onto student learning products and starting to show to their administrators and principals and colleagues in their um, PLCs at their school as well as online um, some of the ways that they're addressing some of these student indicators. So um, let me back up. The lesson that we're showcasing here was one about climate and culture around the world. So as a second grade teacher and as a third grade teacher, um, we all taught about weather and weather is something that is pretty universal um, that people learn about or is that it's a standard across different grade levels. And so that unit or that, I'm sorry, that lesson talks about not only looking at weather where you are, but climate and weather patterns abroad and at large and students do an investigation about a different weather pattern from around the world. And here's an example of a student learning product where the teacher went a step further and they looked at different weather patterns in South America and then they went even further and started to talk about the landforms and why those weather patterns may be happening and what happens to the landforms when those um, weather patterns come through and how does the weather affect uh, the geography and topography of a region. Um, and again, having the teacher then have those indicators to be able to say, hey, there's meaning behind this. And not only is it a really, I'm demonstrating best practices in my teaching, but I'm also demonstrating really, really great um, global skills and teaching global awareness and global attitudes in my students as well, even on the kindergarten and first grade level. Julie, you want to say something? No, no, I was just going to confirm what you're saying. I think we're also seeing teachers looking at, um, you know, standards again, you know, again from a U.S. context, so I apologize for that, and I'd love to hear from others in, the, in other countries about student standards, but certainly for literacy, comparing and contrasting in point of view, there's almost no more effective 
way to do this than through these global investigations. So these, um, you know, being able to compare and contrast, understanding point of view, understanding perspective, these are all part of new standards that global teachers are finding very quickly that global education is the great vehicle for that. It's not an add-on. So, I mean, that's really our message is that this is not an add-on. This is a much more effective vehicle to do this other sort of literacy work that you're already doing. Agreed, Julie. Um, and if you look, I've been doing a lot of um, cross uh, or comparative work um, in my own research and looking at Australian standards and standards in Singapore and the Ministry of Education there. And when we look into content, they're also infusing these ideas um, more readily actually than we are in a lot of ways. And a lot of the content does, there's a lot of parallels. Like Julie said, when we designed the documents, we didn't only look from a Western perspective, we wanted to look at different indicators as well so that these could have some utility, not only for teachers in the US, um, but certainly others internationally as well. And like Julie said, we'd love to keep this conversation going and um, continue to think about ways that we can improve upon them and, and help them grow even more. Um, and so that example of global lessons obviously is also a really great way to get teachers engaged in this work because they're the, the designers and the instructional designers. So uh, the indicator that I have here according to content is that teachers are going to be able to apply their own knowledge of global content and then infuse that into their lesson plan. So something as simple as designing a global lesson um, is definitely hitting on one of those indicators. So uh, we really wanted to not um, overload, <laughs> and, and we'd love to hear some other, um, you know, if there's any other questions that we can uh, moderate from the chat, any questions about the work that we do or that P21 is doing. Um, a really interesting thing, um, uh, just back to the sort of state policy piece, is um, North Carolina, which, you know, has been... Um, has been kind of a leader in this area for a long time, and Lucy mentioned that in the chat. Um, they've now um, just started a digital badge for a, basically a global education micro-credential for North Carolina teachers. Um, so teachers that are in our program and also in other um, global professional development programs will be able to sort of apply for this global micro-credential and uh, potentially get and get other training opportunities and um, other advancements in their career. So that's very exciting. Because um, another aspect of our, the Learning Center is um, digital badging, um, which we have been working very closely with the Mozilla Foundation. Um, so teachers get digital badges, which we also um, did primarily to make sure that international, t our international teachers had um, ways to demonstrate their expertise that cross boundaries, um, that weren't only dependent on continuing education credits. Um, so that's another aspect um, that we're working on with um, the state of North Carolina and that P21 is using that as a framework to push to other states um, as well. And we're also working with a Europe, European partner around competency-based education because um, in Europe the models are quite different where usually teachers just go through teacher training and then they're sort of done. So the idea of doing continuing professional development is uh, not a standard practice throughout Europe. Um, and so uh, we are working with a European partner who will be putting some PD materials in our learning center. So that's been exciting too. And um, Emily or I, I, we can take some time now to, um, oh, and also I see in Ottawa, oh, in Kansas, <laughs> um, the Global Competence Certificate, is that through the Ottawa University, Kareen? So that's, that's is the that? Asia Society GCC. Oh, World gotcha, the World Savvy, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So it's very exciting um, that, yeah, they have been doing a lot of work, um, World Savvy and Teachers College. Um, and we'll also be working with Virginia Commonwealth, um, awesome, uh, to, um, uh, to work on some uh, new programs for master's teachers as well as pre-service. Um, and I think okay. that Peggy just said she was um, signing up for VIF uh, Learn com <laughs> and <laughs> You're very nice, Peggy. We definitely encourage you um, to check it out and, and see some of what's there to offer, um, for sure. Yeah, and I can, I mean, if we have, I guess we have some time, we can, we can show you a little bit of the site. Should I go ahead and do that? Yeah, and, and, I can do it too, Julie, if you'd like. Okay, sure, go ahead. 
And while you do that, I just wanted to respond to Armando. Yeah, in terms of the PowerPoint using, I think Armando, you were talking about using PowerPoint in the classroom. I totally agree. Um, it can be a really interactive tool. Um, it's been very exciting, actually, as we travel to classrooms to see there's the one-to-one -one computing, um, which is definitely happening more and more. So that's exciting. OK, I'm going to let Emily take it away from here. Oh, you know what? Um, so there was a suggestion, Emily, to use app sure. sharing, not web tour. You've got that? You're just doing screen you're just sharing? sharing the screen. You're just yeah. yeah, we're just sharing the screen. Is that okay, Peggy? There we go. Okay. There we go. Yep, she's all set. All right. So if you can all see on my screen right now, um, I've logged into the Learning Center. And what we have here, as Julie and I described, is an online site with professional development, um, a resource library, a community feed, a place for teachers to make classroom and classroom partnerships, badges that I've earned. And I'll just click on each of these and just say one or two sentences about each, and then we can kind of field questions in the chat as well. Here I've, um, I've gone through, let me back up, I've gone through PD modules all related to global learning. You um, see a lot of PD modules on my screen because um, I have access to all of them, but we offer modules for K-5 teachers, for K-12, or for 9-12 teachers, for ESL, for dual language teachers, all to do this global work. Um, they're all online for teachers, um, so this global gateway platform could be accessed anywhere. Um, and teachers engage in watching videos and then creating um, a lesson plan that infuses what they learned about globalizing their classroom or culturally responsive teaching. And as a result of that, then they earn a digital badge that kind of demonstrates um, the knowledge that they learned and what it is that they did in that PD module. And they can share that with principals, they can put it on their LinkedIn page, so on and so forth. So there was a question, Emily. Um, yeah. There was a question from Barbara. Um, so in terms of whether this is mostly, um, this is mostly pre-secondary, so K-12 again up till 18. But I think a lot of this material is actually relevant. Um, I think it can be adapted. Um, certainly the high school curriculum could be adapted for university students. And a lot of the modules that Emily just walked through, we are starting to integrate into um, pre-service into university programs for teachers. Sure, and I actually went back to school to get my degree in this cultural work, and I'm kicking myself because here in Global Gateway, a lot of the stuff that teachers are asking for and want, um, because they're working in such culturally diverse classrooms and in such global classrooms, you know, um, more than almost in 2015, half of our student population will, in fact, be um, from a different background. So they're asking for this, and this is what they want, and I had to go back to school to get it when a lot of teachers are now getting it here on online and Global Gateway, which is just a beautiful thing, and they can do it in their own time, um, which is also wonderful, using the technology. What I'm showing you here is what I like to call our massive global, um, our massive global PLC. Here you can see Julie and I share that we are going to be talking with you all tonight. There's different teachers talking about work that they're doing. There's photos that teachers have shared of different global work that they're doing. In addition, um, each teacher that is a part of our Global Gateway system has their own profile page. Here's mine, where they can share those different things that they're doing in their classrooms via their PD or, or what have you. And then this is available for them to show other teachers um, or their administrators to kind of document the work that they're doing. Here you can see the badges that I've earned, different uh, resources that I have shared. Here's an example activity that I did. Um, with some students, and a picture of a student interacting online with the Mandarin resources. And it's just a really great way for teachers to showcase their global work. In addition, the last thing I'm going to show you um, is the resource library, where those great lesson plans are located. Um, there's lessons that are in uh, Spanish and Mandarin. There are lessons across grade levels, all different subjects. Uh, we've worked really hard to make lessons that not only just address, um, you know, math and reading, but science as well, um, and business and economics. So 
So I'm going to pull up a lesson here. This one's on transportation. I'm just going to give you a little snippet of what it looks like. Julie? Yes. Sorry. You wanted to yep. Yeah, no, I was, I was just uh, typing out to Peggy about the, um, uh, one of the other things that um, uh, related to the, the PD as well as these is that we're linking to these sort of model lessons, which again, we think about all of this as, as professional development. So this is just a resource for teachers. Again, Emily and I have been having a blast sort of going to these different classrooms to te see how teachers are really, they're incredible designers, really. Um, and so they sort of just pick and choose different sort of activities to sort of build into their regular curriculum. So we're doing a lot of development over this year to make this content even more dynamic so we can do sort of more drag and drop as teachers sort of pick and choose their way through, but also, you know, create curriculum resources that provide the context. So it's, you know, we know there's tons of resources out on the web. You have Nat Geo, you have Discovery Ed. It's, there's incredible content that's available for teachers now. And sometimes that stuff, sometimes uh, it's almost overwhelming. So I think some of what we play a role in sort of curating it, putting into an inquiry format, providing formative assessment guidelines, um, just so that we can give teachers as many tools as possible um, for them to really get started. And also try to have a more differentiated approach for teachers that are just starting out as well as teachers that um, are sort of um, well on their pathway uh, as a global yes. educator. And that's, again, um, why kind of the partnership that we have with P21 made sense, um, because they're very, P21 really wants to get this in the hands of teachers and have teachers have tools at their fingertips to be able to do this. So it, so it makes sense. Um, and I, yeah. Go ahead, Julie. Sorry. No, I was just going to say after this we could go to the P21 site. Um, sure, yes. Um, I can share yep. that link with you in the chat and you can, if yep. you want to. I have it as well. And here okay, I'll just great. show you quickly, here's an example of um, one of, I scrolled through the lesson a little bit and you may have gone to see some of the global um, infusion, the um, transportation, thinking about how not only we get around but also people abroad. Um, and there's just really great resources um, for students that relate to the global piece. Um, and I can pull up the P21 um, framework here. Oh, wait, I also, while you're doing that, um, let me just, yeah, the PBS learning media is incredible. Um, I yeah. totally agree, Peggy. Um, I just want to see, I'm trying to scroll through. I noticed the option for K-12 subscriptions, either K-5 or 6-12 or K-5. Yeah, that is true. We do do um, different subscriptions. Um, for different um, teachers, we have a lot of dual language teachers in there, ESL teachers, and then there are some schools that have it all. Um, and then they, their teachers can pick and choose um, what, um, you know, what their, what their teachers should be doing. But yes, we are actually, we're working now with 28 schools in Houston doing some dual language uh, professional development. Um, so when you create, so Peggy has another question, when you create lesson plans on the site, you can share Yes, then with the entire yes. community, yes. So that is one of the biggest features of the PD is that they build um, some curriculum as they go through the PD module. So they and have to, yeah, they can investigate, um, they investigate resources, they create a lesson, um, and then that's what triggers the badge. And so, um, and that badge in the U.S. at this point um, also will then trigger continuing education credits, which we're very excited about. Um, and again, now we're working with European partners to have those badges trigger opportunities for teachers in international uh, contexts. And the other, um, so this is, uh, I'll let Emily sort of describe this since she's on the site. The one thing that we're building this yeah. year is peer review, um, a, a more robust way for teachers to sort of look at what each other have developed and then also give, um, give a lot of comments and, and peer review strategies. Yeah, so the page that I'm on now um, shows just the different lessons, um, and I, I have access to a lot of lessons um, since I'm an, an admin on the site, but um, the teacher will be able to see all of the lessons that they created, and then they can share them out. And in addition, connected to each of these badges is then the lesson plan that you have created, so that you can share this with, I mean, really anyone, right, Julie? Yep. 
So the Mozilla, the great thing about we are um, open badge compliant. So when the badges both appear in our system as well as we can push them out through the backpack. So because these are open, um, these are all open source, you can share this. You will always have um, access into our system to show essentially a micro portfolio. So once you click into that, you have um, a link to your lesson plan and a link to the criteria that helps you earn that. Um, so Emily's about to push um, it to the backpack. And then you'll be able to see them in the backpack. And the thing that's fantastic about the backpack is that if Emily, I know Emily is an avid runner. I know she likes to cook. I know she likes to do a lots of things. You can see different, both Emily as a global educator and then all of the other ways that what, what other kinds of learning she does um, just as part of her life as being a lifelong learner. So again, now we can see, again, uh, it's loading a little bit slow on my site, um, Emily. But um, Oh, sorry. I'm could, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, so, this, uh, is, this is perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> So there's the there's my example lesson that I created to earn that badge um, that Julie's describing, and so those will always live there. And I can also um, look at other lesson plans in addition to looking and revisiting my own. And I'm going to switch over now to the um, the framework. So the website is the main website is p21.org, and then to access the frameworks that we've described to you today, you're going to go to the address that you see in my, um, in my web address there, the URL, um, p21.org backslash, backslash our work backslash global education. And there you will see those six steps that we, or the six essential elements that we discussed, as well as a link to uh, download those entire frameworks for yourself. And also, one uh, neat thing, uh, one of the schools that we work with is a P21 exemplar school. So if you want to check that out as well, uh, Carolina Forest is a school that we work with in this international education work. And so on the site here, uh, under exemplar cases, you can see some more of this in action. There's an example research project, there's a video, there's an interview with the principal at that school. Her name is Helen Gross, Principal Helen Gross. And she talked about the global work and how she's used um, the partnership with P21 as well as some of the resources and tools from um, BIS to help her. She actually discusses this with Helen Soleil, who is um, the I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie Hurd, or executive director of P21. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, and so she interviews um, Helen Soleil, interviews Principal Helen Gross, and they and they talk even more about this work and how it can be done in a school. So I encourage you not only to check out um, this page where the indicators are, but also look at that exemplar school for even more pictures of what it looks like in action. Yeah. And I'm going to go back to, oh, I apologize. I'm going to go back and not share my screen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and go back here. So any other questions? We um, still have about 18 minutes and are more than happy to answer them or chat more about this work with you all. Ah, how is VIF funded? Well, so we, um, so one of the ways that we um, support ourselves is the international teachers um, that we bring into the southeast. Um, there is a special fund in North Carolina that helps support that. So we help bring the teachers in. We place them. We put them in schools. We get them health insurance. We uh, make sure they have good driving skills, and so we make a little bit, we get a little bit of support from that. Um, and then we also work with school districts, so we really try to, some of the site is free, uh, the Learning Center, so there's some resources on there, the online community, please join us um, in that social community. All of those resources are free, and there's some PBI lessons that are also free in there. But the PD modules is something that we do charge a subscription for um, with schools. We also have a very robust dual language program. We have a turnkey model, both in, in North Carolina primarily. Uh, that is also something where we bring in all of the resources. We place teachers and we do all of the support for the dual language. Um, and again, I, I mentioned that we're working in Houston to support their do-it-yourself, the more DIY dual language program for districts. And so we support those districts with resources and professional development modules. Yeah. Oh, somebody. Oh, in Johnson County. Oh, Hilda, that's great. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, we're, yeah, we, they've been wonderful. wonderful. It's, 
Yeah, I, I mean, those international teams, it's just such a gift. It really is, too. And, I mean, we're also starting to um, think about ways to, we, we've worked a little bit with our alumni, but we have this enormous resource of tens of thousands of teachers that have both are experienced teachers in their home countries. They come and share those teaching strategies in the U.S. They build on their practice in the U.S. and then they go home. So we are going to start working with those teachers as well because they're just incredible by cultural global experts um, to be able to both teach in their home country and then and then navigate the U.S. education system, which is no small task. Yeah, so these are very, very. <laughs> yeah, we also learn, though, from teachers, and I I'm working with two this weekend. Um, one teacher from, um, she's British, and then another teacher from rural North Carolina. And both of them talk so passion and passionately and adamantly about this type of work. So I think also there's this sense that, oh, well, I'm not, I haven't traveled or I haven't done any global work yet, so I can't become a global educator. And that's a misnomer because mm -hmm. it's so not true. Um, there's so much culture everywhere people live, right? And so this yeah. work can be done regardless of whether or not you've traveled outside of your own state or not. And once the teachers start to engage in this work, it's amazing how their, their teaching transforms and how they start to see opportunities and possibilities to bring the global in that they never thought before. And it's like I always say, once you go global, you can't go back because <laughs> yeah, you really true. can't, you just start to see the world in a different way. And so um, we're just really excited to get this in the hands of, of teachers like you all um, because we think it's, it's kind of what they've been needing and wanting to kind of um, work with in their teaching. Um, someone yeah. asked about yeah. open badges and what the evidence is for those and how our open badges work. So I'm going to um, defer that to you, Julie, because you are the badge, the badge master for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we've been working really closely with um, the badge community, and so digital badging um, is really um, uh, a way to demonstrate um, your learning um, in sort of non-traditional ways. So for professional development, this is very, very, very important because for at least in the U.S., PD is in a black box. No one knows what teachers have done. Sometimes teachers end up in the same training four times. So in some ways, the digital badge allows everyone to see what professional learning teachers are getting and for teachers to be able to demonstrate what they've done. And there are lots of different programs, particularly for young kids in after school. So this kind of started in the informal learning community where if a, if a kid goes to a museum and does all of this amazing science training, how are they demonstrating that? How can a future employer see all of these amazing skills? Um, it really, sometimes the skills that these employers want or even universities are looking for are not easily demonstrable um, in a resume or on paper. And so it's a way to see these learning pathways. Um, and so the Mozilla with the MacArthur Foundation was very interested in these ideas of connected learning. We all learn everywhere, not just in school. Um, and we all pick up these skills throughout our lives. And how, is, how can different types of diverse learning organizations help the learners demonstrate what they've done and be able to present that to the world, either through social media or through more, um, you know, dynamic um, resumes. So when I came to um, VIF, it seemed a kind of a natural fit that teachers would also want to be doing this work. They're often, you just, they don't, they ha don't have different ways of demonstrating it outside of a traditional resume. So we built it into, um, into our system and used the open badge infrastructure, and I can put that, um, I can put that URL here, so it's a, um, there's a lot of material on the Mozilla blog about open badges. And now in Europe, that's going to be, there's going to be a whole badge Europe. Um, so these are going to be different organizations. We're going to be working with their teacher organizations, but there's all types of industry and informal learning organizations that are using badging so that um, learners are able to de demonstrate all the learning they do in both informal and informal learning institutions. So I don't know, hopefully that, that helped. But um, we've been really, we've been very uh, excited to be a part of this community. It's some very cool people. Um, and it's fun. And it's fun for teachers. Yes. It's really fun for teachers. It's a very different way for them to think about their professional pathway. Um, I also, uh, just to 
to finish up, I posted both Julie and my emails um, on the page here. And not only do we encourage you to check out the Learning Center and, and the VIF International Education Program website, but also connect with us if you have additional questions or want to keep the discussion going. Um, I see some of your names and know some of you have presentations or had them early this week. And so I think it's wonderful that there's a really great network of teachers all here, um, teachers, administrators, what have you, all doing this work and engaged in this type of um, activity and, and conference. Yeah, that's great. And just, um, again, thanking Steve and Lucy as well for putting on yes. the conference. Yay, Lucy and Steve. Woohoo. Um, <laughs> we are great supporters. They are awesome. Yes. yes. Thank you all for joining. Um, we hope you have either a lovely morning or lovely evening, depending <laughs> on where you are. And we look forward to chatting with you soon. Yeah, please yeah. shoot us an email. Great. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you both. Thanks, Steve.